This project is about connecting parallel LED strings to a USB power supply with a, a slight modification to a standard USB cable. And you couldn't just connect the LEDs directly to the USB because the 5 volt from the USB would be far too much for these LEDs. So we're going to add some resistors to drop the current down and then the LEDs will just self-regulate to their desired voltage. And this particular set of LEDs, it's a hundred, I think it's a hundred, uh, mixed colour, and uh, it came with this sort of cheap solar panel types of LED arrangement. And it's worth noting that you get a couple of types of these LEDs these days. You get the type that have the two circuits, alternate polarity, and if they've got effects like patterns and things like that, then that won't work with this project, because whichever way you connect it, only half the LEDs will light, which might be quite useful in certain circumstances, but... It's also where you could connect, you could take a standard string of the sort of pound landy type or dollar tree type lights um, and use them, hook them into it. It just means that, you know, you could just use a power bank or a plug-in cheap power supply. In this case, although these power supplies, these cheapo ones from eBay, aren't really what I'd call electrically safe, the fact that the cabling has at the very least got insulation on it means that, you know, and also the fact that it's a very low load, it's it's going to be, I'm aiming for somewhere between 50 to 100 milliamps, then that should not tax these too much. I mean, okay, these are probably going to explode at some point, but you know what? It's not going to push them too hard. So uh, let's doodle out what I'm going to do first, and I'll show you why I chose the particular value of resistors that I did. So let's bring the notepad in. So here's what we're going to be doing. This is the USB plug, USB plug, and it will have four connections. It will have plus, minus, and of the two data lines. Now, I'm going to be using a resistor on the positive lead and a resistor on the negative lead, two resistors. They could just go in line on one lead, but it's just, you know, it's easier just to put one in each lead. And I'm choosing two 22 ohm resistors. And the reason for that is for safety and power dissipation reasons, which I'll go into in a moment. So I'm taking those two leads out here. There's also the two cores for data. I'm going to cut them at slight different lengths just so they don't touch each other, and we're going to be sleeving them for to stop them being shorted out. This is going to a plug. You don't have to take it to a plug. It could connect directly to the lights, but by putting it in a small plug, it means that you can then use the same little adapter to plug in lots of different lights as you feel like it. And those lights will then just be a basic parallel string. It only works with the sort of simple parallel arrays that normally run off small battery packs or the small solar panel systems. It won't work with the strings of Christmas lights that are designed to run off a much higher voltage supply. So it's really just a parallel array of LEDs. In this case, it's the nice ones that have the uh, phosphor. It's got the blue chips, the green chips, but then it's got the yellow and red are actually a blue chip uh, making a red or yellow phosphor glow. And it means that they've all got a pretty much identical forward voltage, uh, which means they'll all grow up, glow, glow at roughly the same brightness. Now, the reason for choosing the 22 ohms. Combined total is 44 ohms. Based on the fact that the power supply is putting out 5 volts, 5 volts, I expect the LEDs to have a very minimum forward voltage. If you chose some like the traditional orange or red LED strings, which use the, the older gallium arsenide LED technology, they would have a forward voltage of about 2 volts, while these ones will have a voltage that's probably about 2.5 to 3 volts. So I'm basing it on the worst case scenario of 5 volts minus the 2 volts the LEDs equals 3 volts to drop. So, if I use the 44 ohm resistors, then that works out that the current will be I equals V over R, voltage to be dropped, which is the 3 volts, uh, divided by the resistance, which is 44 ohms. So that would be 3 volts divided by 44 ohms. And that's going to come out to roughly 70 milliamps. And that's reasonable enough, because, um, you know, it's a, a, a modest amount of current. Uh, it'll actually be, depending on the types of LEDs you connect, it'll be somewhere between 50 to 100 milliamps. And it might not sound much, but when you've got modern LEDs, it only takes about one milliamp or half a milliamp to make them glow really brightly. And if I calculate the power dissipation from those two resistors now, power equals current times voltage, then it's going to be that 70 milliamps times the 3 volts being dropped across the resistor 
And that will come to, where's the calculator? So it's going to be, the current is going to be 0 0.07, which is 70 milliamps, times the 3 volts dropped across the resistor means it's only going to be 0 0.21 watts. Uh, and that's going to be divided across two resistors, so divided by two, it's going to be 100 milliwatts. And those resistors are rated for about 250 milliwatts continuous operation. So that's well within the rating. But the reason I've actually chosen to use the um, two resistors when one would actually do, is to allow for, well, I'm a complete pessimist. I like to assume that things are going to go wrong. And the worst case scenario here is that the one of the LEDs could fail short circuit, and that does sometimes happen with these LEDs. Or, you know, the cable could get trapped or, or stripped, or it could just have a bad assembly, like, like this piece of heat shrink here that's not really been hung, heat shrunk on properly. What's that about? Let, shall we pull that off and take a look underneath it? It's, yeah... It's the, it's the end string where they've just cut the two. They make this uh, they make this LED string in just one continuous length and cut it to length. So all they've done here is they've cut the two tails here, um, and they were fairly close to each other. So well, they could effectively short out the end here if they touched. Doesn't really happen. I have come across it where it's done that once, and that was the only problem. So I'm just actually going to cut one of these just a wee bit short another. So it's not really possible for it to do that. And then I'll try and slide that bit of heat shrink back over, but I don't really. There it goes. That's, that's good. So anyway, worst case scenario, a dead short. So under that situation, same formula applies, but at this time it's the full 5 volts that's being dropped, divided by the 44 ohms. And this time it's going to result in a current of 114 milliamps. Still not a very high current, but, but it's significant because now when you do the power calculation, power equals current times voltage, it's the 114 milliamps times the 5 volts. And that does add up to quite a modest chunk. So that's uh, 114 milliamps, 0.114 times um, 5 volts equals, and this time it's over half a watt. And even when you divide it down between those two resistors, that would be well over the rating of one resistor. That would be over double it. Even when you divide it down, uh, it's still marginally over the rating of these two resistors, but not significantly so. And uh, I did some tests, I got a couple of resistors, I put one in heat shrink sleeving and I just left one in open air and I grilled them and I tried them at various current overloads and left them for several hours at a time and to be honest they were just so resilient, it was surprising. There was no, at one point I managed to get the a slight resistory, you know, a slight hot ceramic -y smell off them but it took a massive overload to get that. But typically uh, if you do overload them slightly, in the case of this, where it was just running marginally over the, over its uh, 250 milliwatt rating, it's not going to be too dramatic. So, uh, kind of, it's a slight compromise that uh, this the choice of the 220 ohm, two, two ohm resistors. It was either that, or I was actually going to use four 10 ohm resistors, and it was just going to be a bit cumbersome. So, this is what I'm choosing: two 22 ohm resistors. Right. So let's uh, start making this then. We'll start with the lead, which came from Poundland. And these leads are actually pretty good, the ones from Poundland. And you could leave it full length, or you could just keep it short, because uh, these strings of LED tend to have a fairly modest sort of cable on them anyway, so I don't want just tons of cable to hide all over the place. So I'm going to cut this down to about 300 millimetres or a foot or so, about there. So where's my snips? So I'm going to cut that off. This is a typical uh, iPhone-y type charging cable by Signalex. It's one of the sort of brands that are sold at, at Poundland. Um, and they seem to get good reports as being good quality. And certainly any of that I've taken apart in the past have had modestly good size of cable inside. So now I'm going to just strip this by just nibbling gently around with the snips. Just enough to nip the outer layer without going in too far into the sort of inner layer. I'm going to nibble it all the way around, and then just try and pull that off. There we go. Now, there's a pink lead, a black lead, a gr green and a white. The green and white are noticeably thinner. They're the data lines. So I'm going to cut one not quite flush, because some of these have a metal screening cable in them. So I'm going to cut it maybe about three millimetres to eighth of an inch, and the other one just a tiny bit more so that they can't easily short together. This is just a precaution, it doesn't really matter if they short together, but you know, because most USB ports are protected, but I'm just 
it, it makes sense to just avoid things like a short circuit. Now I'm going to strip these. This is where it could get a bit tricky because it is quite thin wire. And the first thing I'm going to do is check polarity. Now I'm using my Unior wire sniffers here, wire strippers here, and I've tried the automated wire strippers and they work okay, but they tend to just wear out after a while and start chewing up cable and skidding, and they're just not compatible with some cables, particularly tri rated cable, uh, which is a sort of heavy industrial sort of like panel wiring cable. And I like those uh, wire strippers. Uh, I ended up switching back to them after. I've been working at a place called Hussman in the panel building uh, workshop and the old school electricians there just swore by those things. They said they're, they're just great and to be honest they're absolutely right, they're the most reliable wire strippers about. So now I'm going to get a meter, if I can find a suitable meter, let's uh, just grab this meter and I'm going to keep these wires separate and I'm going to plug it into a USB power bank. And what I'm actually doing is checking that the polarity is right because you just never know what you're going to get. Particularly if you use a cable from China. You just don't know if red is actually going to be positive and black is going to be negative. So I'm going to put the red to the red and the black to the black and I should get 5 volts. If I had negative 5 volts, the polarity would be wrong, but the polarity is right. So that's fine. I'll just unplug this before I inadvertently short that out. So I'm going to um, tin those leads now because I'm going to be soldering them onto resistors. So I'm just going to flow a bit of solder onto them. Like so. Noting that as soon as I do that, the insulation peels back very quickly, but that doesn't really matter too much because I'm going to be putting sleeving over it. I'm also going to be putting a bit of sleeving over the base here. So I'm going to cut a bit at about, say an inch or 25 millimetres or so of this size. And this is apparently 3.2 millimetre sleeving. It looks a lot bigger than that, but I guess that must be, they must be just rating it for its sh shrunk size, although it seems to shrink down lower. And I'm going to feed this over all the cables, including little data cables, but because I'm not actually putting it on right now um, and shrinking it down right now, I'm going to slide it, if I can slide it on here, it's quite a sticky uh, insulation here. I'm going to slide it out the way to keep it, because I don't want to accidentally heat it while I'm soldering anything at this end. Because uh, if it partially shrinks, it just means it will be quite hard to uh, actually get it into position later. Now I'm going to get the resistors. The resistors are the 22 ohm resistors, and the colour code is red red for 2 2, and then the multiplier band, the third band, is a zero, which means there's no multiplier, so it is just red red 2 2, it's 22 ohms. And I'm going to cut the end maybe somewhere, I'm going to cut it about 5 millimetres, quarter of an inch ish, and I'm going to put it into these uh, helping hands here. I'm going to tin the end of that resistor with a bit of solder lead-based solder because it's the best type. I've actually got a whole build-up of this, I really need to wipe that tip. Let's try that again. There we go. And I'm going to add a slight touch of flux. I've already tinned a wire here, so I'm just going to add a touch of flux onto this using a flux pen. This is a standard flux pen. It's, it's basically liquid flux inside. It's for electronic applications, particularly surface mount stuff. And it's got this fibrous tip and a release valve that when you press it down in a surface, uh, it releases the, some of the liquid down into the fibrous tips. You just basically refresh it every so often, noting that if you put it on any wooden surface and press down, it would just leave a big skid mark of, a, of flux, so that's not ideal. So you want to do it on a, a surface that you're not too bothered about getting messed up. So I'm going to add a wee touch more solder onto this wire after cropping it to length. And I'm going to put it onto the resistor lead, which I've just put some flux and solder on. And I'm just going to heat them. Oh, I'm just going to actually make sure I support this properly. You want to keep the wires really steady together. Heat them so it flows. And then just hold them there for a second until the solder hardens. And that's you got your connection. Next comes the other resistor. Once again, I'll cut uh, one of the leads down to about a quarter of an inch, five millimetre ish. Put it into the helping hand here. Crop that lead down to roughly the same as the other one. Flood some solder in both of them. Just uh, tin them with a wee sort of blubber solder. 
You could hold them together and then put the solder in, but uh, I think for most people it's easier just to pre-tin them and then throw them together. The flux is optional, it just it provides a better mating of the... When you reflow the solder, it, you don't need to do it, but sometimes you can end up with a little peak pulls off because the lack of flux means the solder's just a little bit dry. So now I'm just going to uh, put those together and reflow. Okay. And now, I'm going to add a wire onto the other side. Now this is where you could actually use a bit of sleeving, and you could slide it over and you could just hook these straight on once you've worked out polarity, which I'll show you afterwards. Uh, and then you could just have them permanently attached. But I'm going to be adding a little socket onto it. So for that, I'm going to add a couple of bits of wire. So here's the bits of wire. And I'll, I'll trim these down afterwards to length. So I'm just going to strip Roughly a quarter of an inch again, five millimeter ish. And when you are soldering onto these resistors, don't use the clip on the resistor body itself. It's better to support it by one of the leads or the solder joint because the body of the resistor has a sort of protective coating outside the actual carbon film itself in these resistors, and it's quite easy to damage it. So um, you just want to grip it only by the set of leads at the end. So I'm going to uh, tin these wires and the LED, uh, uh, the LED, the resistor. I'll grab a fresh bit of solda here. I'll tin both of these at once, just to save a bit of time. And tin that, and tin that. And I'll put a bit of flux, it can go in either, so I'm just going to put it on the wires here. Now that's the grey, uh, which is the negative, so I'm going to get the black wire and I'm going to flow onto that. So I'm just going to hold that, support it nice and firmly, and flow them together. Perfect. Ideal. Then get the positive. and do the same. So this is the red wire going on to the pink. Uh, now, they do have, they've got a different version of this cable they call better quality. And the main difference is it has a metallic screen on the outside, possibly slightly thicker cable, and actual red and black. It's, it's, it is really good quality. But this is fine, this is perfect, this is ideal. So now I'm gonna be just uh, cropping these down to the same length. And then I'm going to get a bit of heat shrink sleeving. And this one's 2.4 millimeter, they call it. And it's going to go down and just cover the resistors. So it doesn't need to be too long. Um, I'm going to cover the resistors plus take it fairly close to the other, the cut off data cables. So cut it round, well, whatever, whatever it works out for you. This is about 40 millimeters, inch and a half ish. So I'm going to slip these over those resistors now. This is just to stop them from shorting out against each other and potentially causing the power supply, the USB power supply unhappiness. And I'm going to melt that heat shrink now. So to shrink the heat shrink down I'm going to use a heat pen. Now this is where it's quite advantageous that I've got a sort of Yahoo 8786D soldering station which has this really quiet heat pen on it and it, it's just great for heat shrink sleeving it's just you know it's supposed to be for reworking electronic components I never actually use it for the surface mount stuff I use it primarily for heat shrink and removing labels and stuff like that it's a very useful little pen so that's that shrunk down and before I go any further I'm actually well tell you what let's put this up out here so it just uh get out the way. It runs on for a while when you put it back in its holster because uh, it, uh, it's just in a cool down mode. Now I'm letting that make sure that's cool enough to actually do this and now I'm sliding this heat shrink up over those data leads and over the two other bits of heat shrink like that. So this is going to make it just neater and it's going to insulate everything down here. And I'm going to get the heat pen and now I'm going to heat shrink that area of the cable. 
and this just it, it provides a better quality finish. Now, if you've not got one of these heat uh, heat guns, you can also use either a paint stripper gun used very carefully to do it from a distance, lots of sort of waving around. Uh, hair dryers don't really work, they just don't really get that hot usually. Uh, the other option is to use a lighter, uh, a cigarette lighter, but just again, just sort of wave it gently and if you linger too long it's going to actually burn the cables and the insulation. Right, next I'm going to put the connector on and this is where you've also got an option. Uh, I'm going to strip these leads about just over an eighth of an inch. 3 millimeter ish and I'm going to crimp on some Molexi style terminals. Now this is the connector I'm going to be using. It's a really common connector, I, as far as I know it is based on a Molex connector. It's not made by Molex, it's a lot cheaper than a Molex connector. You can buy these bulk from your electronic suppliers um, and they're a great connector. <clears throat> and they, it's worth noting that you buy the shells and the, well let's see where's all the other bits that I've completely lost now. You buy the shells, you buy the sort of PCB uh, side of the connector on its own, and then you have to buy the contacts for inside the shell. These usually come in either packs of pre-cut terminals, or as more as the usual case these days, a big reel for machine uh, use that you, you've got about 500 or 1,000. And the tool I use, uh, you don't have to use a tool on these, you can solder them. Uh, if, if you do solder them, angle the back down the way, uh, and hold it in something like this sort of helping hand so that when you put solder on it doesn't flow up into the actual spring-loaded contact area otherwise it will just stop it working properly. But I'm using a crimping tool which is not an official Molex crimping tool, it's a generic one, very common. This one came from Rapid Electronics in the UK as did the connectors. Um, you can get these now from sort of various online suppliers because of course like the, the little mini connectors are really popular and things like modelling and you know remote control stuff. So now I've put that crimp in, I'm just going to slide this wire into it. And one of the nice things about the crimping tool is it doesn't just crimp the electrical connection side of it, it also crimps onto the insulation with a separate section which actually acts like a strain relief which is nice, I like that. I use these connectors a lot. I will say the first time I started using them I found them frustrating because uh, it takes a bit getting, getting used to them and they're not really what you call a fast connector to put on. But the more you uh, use them, uh, you just find that, you know, it gets easier. Okay, we're almost there. So now, this is where you get the decision of which is going to be positive and which is negative. I've used a three-pin connector, I'm just, uh, it's to differentiate between the fact that this is current limited and I normally use the sort of two-pin connectors uh, for sort of things like a connectors like this, just for something like a, a general sort of power supply like 12 volts or whatever, so I want to actually make sure I don't get stuff plugged in accidentally into the wrong type of connector. So I'm using the 3 pole connector here. These ones have a 1 marked in 1 connector, so I'm just going to make that a positive. And I'm going to put the negative in the other outer connection. And that is our adapter made. <clears throat> now all we need to do to finish this is connect the LED string of our choice to a plug and the fact that it is plugged that you can put a plug on uh, just any string means you could have loads of different strings or when you get sick of this string you can get another string and just make just solder a plug on and it means you can just use this same little lead to power them all independently. Right so this one uh, to find the polarity for a start in this because you'll need to get the polarity right. I do see a row of dots in this. I'm not sure what that indicates. So I'm going to actually strip these. Noting that the cable in these, it's usually thickish insulation, but very thin cable. So quite delicate. And I'm going to work out the polarity. Let's, uh, solder, let's tin these with solder first, because they're going to be tinned with solder anyway. So let's just in that and that you can probably hear the rain now it's just been it's just gearing up for another stormy winter here that's what happens when you live in the middle of the Irish Sea so now to get the polarity I'm going to take a standard lithium button cell and because these are all in parallel and they'll light up out sort of three volts so I'm just going to put it on a random direction and they've not lit so I'm going to reverse that and now they have lit 
Not very brightly because it is just a tiny little button cell, but that's enough to indicate that this lead, the one with all the dots in it, happens to be the positive. And a way that's quite handy, especially when you've already put a bit of solder in it, is just to get a sharpie and just to colour the solder. Yeah, it just, you know, as soon as you remelt it, it will just flow in anyway, so it just temporarily marks that as being a sort of the red lead. Cause is that going to show at all? I think it is showing a wee bit the sort of red on it. It's very visible to me. Now, to make sure I put the wire onto this connector the right way around, I'm going to plug it in here. And again, the red sharpie's coming out. Because uh, there's the red lead. And I'm going to put a dot on the other side, which is a positive. And then I'm going to pull it apart. Now with these, when I'm soldering wires on, I'm going to put a bit of heat shrink sleeve in the wire so that I can cover it afterwards. But I like to just uh, push the... Well, I'll show you when I do it. I'll... I'll like to sort of self-align the wire, so to speak, in these just by placing it in against the end there. So I'll show you as it when I do it. So let's get, this is a, another size of heat shrink, this is 1.6 millimeter, and I'm going to cut a couple of bits about 12 millimeters long, about half an inch, and hopefully they're going to fit over this uh, cable. It's a close fit, but it's working. And I'm going to push them way up. You don't want them too close to the end, because otherwise when you solder them, it will cause it to grip onto the... It will make it shrink slightly and it grips onto the insulation. It just makes it very tricky trying to get them into position afterwards. That's a fairly close fit, but you know what? It's, it's good enough. I wouldn't like to go any... I wouldn't like to use that in a thicker wire, though, so I'd have to go up a size in the insulation. So now I'm going to flow some solder, pre-tin the connector. And because I've been using flux in the other ones, I'll use flux in this one as well. So there's now a little uh, blob of solder that's pretty much sitting. It's flowed onto the contacts and it's sitting on top. And I'm going to place the wire on top of that. So let's get some flux on that. So... The positive wire is the one I've got the red dot on, uh, the red uh, sharpie on, and it's going here. So this is the negative wire, so it's initially going over on the negative terminal. So I'm just going to sit it in against into that little groove, touch it down onto the contact below, and flow the solder. And remember that the pin on the other side will get very hot. Don't linger in these little terminals, because uh, if you do, it softens the plastic and the pins can go at funny angles. And now I'm doing the same with the positive. So the positive one which I've made the mark on and then the red dot, I'm lining up on top of that and I'm just going to flow it. And there it's flowed. Perfect. If you do get any little uh, solder spikes, which I've not really got here, but there's a tiny one, so I'll just... Uh, you can just crop those solder spikes off. It just sometimes happens when you're reflowing stuff. And I'm going to let that cool down a second. And then I'm going to slide the heat shrink along over both the wire and the um, the pin. Might take a bit of shoveling, shoving to get it to sort of slide over properly, because it is this uh, solder resist is very close to the size of the actual cable itself, so it is just taking a wee bit of effort to get that to slide over the both the solder and the pin which is slightly offset to the cable insulation but that's it it's now slid over so um, I'm going to get the heat pen again and just shrink that and that acts as kind of a strain relief as well as insulation and now theoretically if everything's working well then these LED lights should now light if I plug them into this adapter and I'm also going to plug in this little power monitor thing and see what our current it is. So that's about four point, that's five volts dead on. Plug this in. The LEDs have all lit quite brightly, I have to say. That's quite good. And the current is 70 milliamps, which is ample for these. That's, that's ideal. So, um, yeah, that's a good result. And it also means you can use these on one of these little cheapo plug-in power supplies. Even the ones that go bang and fly out the wall in pieces with smoke and flames and set the house on fire. Yeah, that's a good result. That's very good. Uh, that's nice. In fact, uh, just to show you how bright these look on that uh, power supply, if I turn this off and I just 
reset the brightness. Yep, yeah, that's uh, slightly exaggerating, but you get the gist. It's, uh, it's actually looking pretty good. And if you think of it, the USB power supplies, they can, uh, they could run at 70 milliamps. That could probably run for, even the most basic one, it could probably run for about 10 hours. So, you know, if you wanted uh, some lights out in the garden in the evening, you could, as long as you kept the USB power bank uh, in a waterproof container, uh, then you could then have a bright string of lights over the tree just powered by a rechargeable USB power bank. But these ones, these lights are going to my mum's bedroom. Uh, they're her new general illumination lights in her bedroom because uh, she's got Alzheimer's, so she's bed bound and she, she just appreciates the, a little bit of light at night. She likes the fear lights, they're sort of visually stimulating. Um, so instead of the ones that have got the battery operation and we've got rechargeable batteries, we're just going to get a good quality USB power supply and that's going to power the lights in her room. Uh, and whenever we choose we can change them or indeed we can put uh, different caps in these to make them just look different so yeah good result all round